God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. Wonders is dependable. You can depend on him. You can depend on him. You can rely on him. He is reliable. This God of wonders does not respect persons. He'll do unto you what he did for somebody else. And one thing that I know about him, I'm going to talk about today, is that he is unpredictable. You can't predict him. You can predict God. God works in diverse situations and circumstances and however he feels right to do. And he's able to do that because he owns everything. He controls everything. He's in charge of everything like I said last week. That's why he's able to do. That's why he has authorization to do. That's why he has audacity to do. Glory to God. Whatever he wants to do. I like to serve a God like that. Who can do anything. Who, who, who's nobody tells him how to do it or what to do. Nobody questions him. No one can question God. I like to serve a God like that. And I like to appeal my case to a God like that. Who I know is just. He, he has no favoritism. He does not favor one over the other. He's a just judge. That's what the Bible says. The judge of all earth. And, and I see something in scripture that helped me to understand this. God called Moses. Called Moses. And at some point as they had this fellowship and, and they had this interaction together. Moses being the leader of his people. God said, Moses, I want to put into your hands something that no man has ever handled. And the Bible calls it the commandment, the Ten Commandments, or the Decalogue. said, I want to put it in your hand. And Moses is so favored, ladies and gentlemen, that what God delivered into his hand was written by God. So the finger of God wrote it on this tablet of stone. God carved it out of the mountain. And he wrote them with his hand. What, what a privilege for Moses to handle what God. So Moses, Moses' relationship was that deep that God would call him. And you know what God said? God said, come up to the mountain. I'm not going to do it in the valley. Come up to me. So that, that, there are times that God will ask you and ask me to come to him. God does not always come to people. God calls people to come to him. And when he calls somebody or uh, some people to come to him, there's always a reason why God is calling somebody. I love the call. Because I know my call is greater than my fall. When God calls me, my fall is over. He raises all of those ten because of his call over my life. You ought to celebrate God's call over your life. If God calls you, you ought to celebrate that. But I find people who minimize the call of God over their life. You never can do that if you're a wise man. God calls. And sometimes out of a fall, God calls a man. And his call is always greater and better than your fall. And so here, we see God call Moses to come up to Mount Sinai to be with him. Now, let's read Exodus chapter 20. Chapter 19, verse 20, sorry. Exodus 19, 20. Bible says here, and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. And the Lord came down upon the mountain. And then what follows? On the top of the mountain. 
And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. <laughs> God himself spoke to Moses. Come to the Mount Sinai. I have a word for you. I have something for you. Come up to Mount Sinai. And Moses, the Bible said Moses went up to Mount Sinai. And before we tie it together, let's look at another aspect of God. God is not only a God of the mountaintop, God also comes down to the valley. <laughs> Sometimes God comes to the level of man. The Garden of Eden, that's what was happening. Every cool of the day, the Lord came to the level of man. And the Lord sits with him. I said, let's have fellowship. How did your day go, Adam? Eve, what was on the menu this afternoon? And God, fellowship with them. You're going to get to that. Glory to God. Let's see what the Bible says. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11 and verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, just like he said before, he said, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them where? Unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Not Mount Sinai now. The, the tabernacle of the congregation. It's a privilege when God calls you to the mountain. It's not always a crowd. <laughs> it's not always a crowd. Sometimes fellowshipping with God is a lonely place. Because narrow is that way that leads to the presence of God. Only a few go therein. Sometimes you have to take that walk by yourself as you're going up to the mountain top. And climbing up to the mountain onto the top of Sinai is never an easy thing. Following God's call is never an easy thing. It's easier to gather people than to follow a call. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, gather, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel. That's easy. We can, we can call them and gather them together. But following the call of God, sometimes it's always a lonely place. Only a few go therein. Sometimes the climb can be steep, glory to God. And it be hard, but it said, I will make your feet like the hen's feet. And you will climb upon your high places. It's not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Can rely on my power when I obey the call of God. Sometimes it is hard us. Sometimes you feel frustrated. Sometimes you feel the ache and the pain and the burden that comes upon you. But a man who loves God goes along with God because there's a glory up there that only those who get up there can receive. And now, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. After Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, the Bible says folk could not look at him no more because there was a veil over his face that reflected like the sun out of heaven that everyone who saw Moses coming had to cover their face from Moses. It takes a man or a woman who is willing to defy the climb up to the mountain to receive back down the glory. The glory is not cheap, ladies and gentlemen. It's easier to gather than to follow the call. It's easier. And so God said to him, gather together me 70 men who you know us to be elders and officers over them. He said, bring them unto the... They, you can't bring them all to Mount Sinai. He said, bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation. He said, 
the next verse says, I will take from you your spirit and I will put upon them. You know, Jesus Christ was going on the Mount of Transfiguration. That was the first and last time he went to the Mount of Transfiguration. And he had 12 disciples. Then he said to John, he said to Peter, he said to James, let's take a trip. We can't get them all rest, nine people. We get just two, three of you. We go up to the mountain. And the Bible says, as they went with him, and somehow, <laughs> Jesus was transformed or transfigured. And they saw the glory that came down upon him. The garment shone. Everything about Jesus was transformed. You know what Christ was doing? Giving them a glimpse of the glorified Jesus. And when they saw him, they said, wow, we have never seen him like this. And they said, Jesus, why should we leave this place? Let us build for you one tabernacle for Moses, one tabernacle. Say, so we're not leaving this place. Jesus said, you don't understand. I just wanted you to see something that nobody else will see. Tell nobody what you have seen. Not, not everybody made it up there. But some did. When God called you, it may be a difficult thing to do. Oh, Lord. You know, Moses, when Moses, when God first called Moses, don't forget, Moses was doing his thing and taking care of the animals and that somehow God was manifesting in the bush. And he saw something. I can see fire, but the bush is not consumed. This is different. I got to go check it out. And, and you know, sometimes God has a way of getting your attention. That was God's way of getting Moses' attention. He got to come here. And he began to go to the bush. He saw her. The moment he came nigh, God roared out of the bush. Moses, Moses, the land upon which you stand is holy ground. Take off your shoes. And Moses would have started. So I did not know that God was in the bush. And sometimes you will never know that God is in the bush. You see the bush, but God is right there. God is right there. That, that's why it's a God of wonder. It's unpredictable. You cannot predict him. He, he'll find a way to manifest himself in the bush. Fire burning, but the bush is not consumed. The fire was not fire like we know it. It was God's glory that consumed the bush. When God comes into your life, his glory consumes you. You can't hold it. When God's power is working and moving in your life, you cannot hold yourself. Because now it's not about you. It's about God's power that's working in your life. It's the wonder of God that's working in your life. I always love Samson. <laughs> You know, Bible says that Samson was in the camp that every now and then the Spirit of God came upon Samson and he would do some strange things. Everybody, like, whoa, 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 Samson is in the house now. And everybody check him out. He's in church like this. And all of a sudden the power of God comes into Samson. Samson lay hand on somebody. <laughs> Holy Ghost comes down. I said, wow, my God. There's something about this. The Bible says even his parents couldn't understand what was going on with Samson. Didn't understand him. The guy was just, was just doing some, some strange stuff. Because the glory of God was upon him. When God's glory is on your life, you don't obey natural laws no more. Glory to God. You don't obey natural laws no more when the glory of God comes upon a man's life. The Spirit of God was moving that young boy. And, and they couldn't understand what was going on with this young child. But God was taking him somewhere. When you begin to see those strange manifestations in your life, 
God is taking you somewhere. It shows that a season is opening up for you. You find yourself in the middle of the night that you never did before. A burden to pray. And you kneel down by your bedside. And you begin to pray. And tears flowing down your cheek. You tell yourself, how did I get myself here? It is not you. It is the Spirit of God that is working in your life. Why? Because it is opening you into a new season. And you just don't know it. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Strange things begin to happen. And Moses saw that bush. And Peter, James, and John, they saw the glowing mountain. And Jesus being transfigured. And they said, wow. We have never seen such a thing before. But guess what? They had to pay the price to go up to the mountain in obedience to the call. The call is not always easy. But those who stay with it. You know what Bible says? It says, he that is planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the court of his God. There is no flourishing without planting. can flourish if it's not planted. And it can't flourish if it's not planted in the house of God. That's what I said. He that is planted in the house of God shall flourish in the court of our God. That's what it's here. What is your call today? Have you abandoned your call for the fall? The call, like I said, is what, it's, it's what changes a man or woman. When Moses dared to go up to that Mount Sinai, when he came back, he was not the same again. Glory to God. And you know what the Bible said? It said they came to him. They came to him. It said they came to him. It said their faces were lightened. That's what they said. That's glory. Glory came on their face. It said they went back rejoicing. Glory to God. When you come to him, when he's done with you, you go back rejoicing, not the same way you came. That's why we always pray that God, I will not go back the same way that I came. Let me be in your presence. I may shock you with this. Not everybody that come to church get into his presence. Not everybody. Not everybody that walks through the doors of the church and be in the sanctuary and be in the music, the praise, and the worship, and experience all of that. Not everybody walk into his presence. No, 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 no. Some folk come in, they're not in God's presence. But you find folk who come into church, and somehow, some way, they cross the barrier of naturality into the supernatural. And they find themselves in the presence of God. Glory to God. And they begin to say like Jacob. I did never know that God was in this place. I can feel the presence of my God. Glory to God. And that's how you begin to lift up your hand. And worship when nobody else is worshiping. When nobody else is worshiping. And you're worshiping God. And everybody wonder. Is he also among the prophet? I didn't know the brother could worship like that. You know what happened? He just found his way into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. And at its right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. When you come into his presence, you go back rejoicing. Your faces are lightened. And the Bible said they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. So now Moses, go back to Moses' story. And Moses is called up to Mount Sinai. God had invited him and it was him by himself and Aaron the Moses was right in God's presence and the Bible says God met with him, gave him the Ten Commandments and later on God said to him Moses I want to show to you that I don't only act on the mountain top but I also act in the tabernacle, the congregation and I said, I need you to give me 70 men. Gather them all together in the tabernacle. And I will come into the tabernacle. 
I will, God said, I will come into the tabernacle and I will take from you the spirit that I put in you and I will take that spirit and I will put it on 70 men. And now, ladies and gentlemen, that shows the capacity of man that God can take a spirit from Moses and he will distribute it among 70 men. And they all received that spirit. And Moses is still anointed. It shows the capacity of man. Now Jesus came to town and, and demon possessed man tried to harass Jesus. Jesus said, come on down here, demonic spirit. What's your name? He said, my name is Legion. Uh-huh. Say, I know, I recognize you. How many of you there? So we are many. <laughs> Glory to God. And when Jesus cast out the devils and they got into a herd of swine, it was an entire herd that went into the water and drowned. All of them. The power that came into one single man. You know, scripture said that nobody could bind him. You put chains on him, he'll rip those chains. They could not restrain him, the capacity of man. They could not restrain that man because there was such a power, a demonic power that has possessed that one person and thousands of demons was living in him. That's a capacity of man. If man can carry that many demons, then he can sure carry a boatload of the anointing of God. Glory to God. So that's how he got out of Moses. The spirit he said, bring, bring them all to me. Bring them all to me. Say, I will, I, I'm going to anoint them all 70 right now. I'm not going to bring new anointing from heaven. I'm going to take from you. I'm going to take from you. And I believe Moses had cultivated so much anointing. So thou anoints my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Moses would have had a running over anointing. And God said, you, you're so anointed that I can take from you and bring it to 70 men and you will still have the anointing of God in your life. But all of this was happening in the tabernacle of the congregation, which was in the valley. So now, picture what, what we're trying to see here. On the mountaintop, and in the valley. God is God. Hallelujah. Wherever I find myself, whether I be on the mountain or I be in the valley, God is still what? He's still God. Number one, when God comes to man, when God comes to the tabernacle, he comes to instruct. He comes to instruct. God as, is an instructor. God instructs man. He tells you what to do. Why? Because he's your creator. So, well, you know, pastor, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah, I, can't, I may not be able to tell you what to do. But God can. God will instruct you what to do. The Ten Commandment, the Ten Commandment was a commandment of instruction. When Moses came up and God said, I'm delivering to your hand Ten Commandment, it was commandment of instruction. Follow this. It was not negotiable. <laughs> it wasn't like what God said. Moses, you know, we need, to, we need to rectify a document. I know you, you are the leader of the people. You know, do they like to eat meat? Moses said, no, they don't like to eat meat. But why not let's have fish and have a compromise? <laughs> no, no. God brought him and said, Moses, you see these ten things? Take it back to them. All of them must follow these ten things. That's it. When God comes to instruct a man or woman, it's not negotiable. God doesn't negotiate with us. God tells us what to do. 
he has the final say. God bless you, my brother. And, and sometimes it takes God in this new dispensation, it takes God a little bit of time to come to that level. Because he, he tried to get your attention. He said, my son, I want, you, I want you to take some time to pray. He said, God, I'm too tired. You know, I've been working all day. I've been working all night. Well, that's good, but I need you to take some time to pray. And you're not listening. And God comes again and said, well, son, you know what I told you the other day? You need to take some time to pray. Because I need you to take some time to pray. You know, God, you know I can. You know, and then we give all excuses. That's what Moses said. This is what Moses said. Now, let's go back to Moses. Moses was uh, uh, by the burning bush. And the Lord said, Moses, Moses. And the, Moses came by. And God said, go back to Egypt. Moses said, huh? What? Go back to where? God said, I need you to go back to Egypt. Because I need you to free your people. And my people. And Moses said Lord. And Moses would have been wondering. Why did I come to this part. Of the field. When I saw the burning bush. I should have run away. <laughs> now. God says. Think about it. Moses had committed some high crime. And misdemeanor. Egypt was looking for him. He was a fugitive. And God said, go back to that same place. <laughs> Who would do that? And Moses had to think about it. Because some messages that God brings to you, you will have to think about it. Because you just cannot understand why God is asking you to do what he's asking you to do. Why would God say to Moses, go back to Egypt? He was running away from Egypt. Sometimes you can never overcome your past if you don't confront them. God wants to make Moses a better leader. But there was his past that he needed to confront. And God said, go back to Egypt. Go get my people out. Moses said, okay, Lord, you know I'm a stammerer. I can't talk that good. God said, I know that, but I also have Aaron, who is your brother. He can talk real good. He will speak for you. Whatever you say, Aaron will tell it right. Moses had no other excuses to give but to obey God. Because God was instructing Moses. He was not negotiating with him. Moses, 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 how are you doing today, Moses? Would you like to go to Egypt? Moses said, no. He said, God, all right, I'll call Aaron. No. It was Moses, go back to Egypt. Moses said, I'm running. God said, I knew that 40 years ago. I was in Egypt when you ran. Moses, go back to Egypt. Yeah, you know, when your supervisor is talking to you like that, you know that this is a serious matter. Yeah, you sit in the office and talking to the boss and say, well, you know, boss, say, yes, I know that, but I want you to do it. And then he say, I really want you to do it within the next 24 hours. How many of you will say any other word? Will you say yes, sir? When your boss tells you, I really, I really need you to do it within the next 24 hours. You will say nothing, except you want to lose your job. And Moses here, Moses was like, okay, God, I'm going now. And Moses went. So what I'm saying, when, when God comes to a man, God comes to instruct a man. When Moses was brought to the mountaintop, to, God came on the mountain, delivered him the Ten Commandments, it was to instruct him. So when God calls you and say, Brother X, I want you to come. Just know that God has an instruction for you. And be ready for that instruction. It's not going to be negotiated. But when men come to God, when we come to God, God comes to institute his will over our life. That will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. He comes to set up order. 
When we come to, we came to him today, that's why we're here. We came to God today. God, we come into God instead of God, we institute order in our lives. So it's for the good of man. When he said, gather to me 70 people, it was for the good of the 70 people. And blessed are those 70 who were invited. Because there were millions of others who were not invited to the meeting at the tent. When man comes to God, ladies and gentlemen, as the 70 came to him, he came to be tested. When you, when you, when you came today, you, all of us came today, God, for some of us, God is testing you right now. It's testing you. God is going to find out how you work this message that you're hearing today. And there are two ways or one or two things that I do when I come to a place and a message comes to me. It's either I receive it or I reject it. Either I receive the message or I reject the message. But God is waiting to see what you do. Because when I come to him on a Sunday morning like this, say, God, here am I. Send me. God said, I will institute something in you. I'm going to watch what you're going to do with it. But when God calls us to the mountaintop, he wants to test. He wants to try you, not test. Try your faith. You know, that's what he did for Abraham. Abraham took his son and told his wife, I'll be back with my son. And he went on Mount Moriah. What was God doing when he says, sacrifice your son on Mount Moriah? He was trying his faith. You say, you love me. But you're going to show it now that you truly love me. God's going to try you and me. You see, I, 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 love, I love songs. But when I sit here, I think the praise and worship people's job is more difficult than mine. <laughs> you know why I say that? I stand here, I tell you what God said. God bless you, my brother. Glad to see you. I tell you from the Bible what the Lord said. But these folk, they come here, they tell God what God wants to hear. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice. You love him? Okay. We're going to find out after church. If you truly love me. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you. Ah, okay. Do your word may fall, you never let me go. We'll find out. We'll stomp wall. I'm going to fall. We'll find out if you really not let me go. <laughs> Glory to God. And, and that's why I say a lot of times, when you are singing those songs, you better make sure you mean it. Make sure you understand that. Look, I'm not saying don't sing them. Don't come to church next Sunday and say, well, pastor said don't sing those songs. I'm not going to sing again because I don't know if I truly love God. <laughs> and you call the choir to sing. They say, pastor, well, give us the song. It's the one that you give us, we will sing. <laughs> Glory to God. But I do listen to these songs. And sometimes I do, I do meditate on them in the midst of it. To understand the gravity of what I'm saying. Because when we say those things, we are speaking the language of God. That's what God understands. That's what God understands. A man said to God, he said, God, I'm going to battle. He said, when you give me victory in this battle, anybody, anything, he said, that comes out of my house first, I give it to you. That's the language of God. Ah, and God heard that in heaven. He said, wow, the man just spoke my language. He said, okay, you want victory? I will give it to you. But don't forget, that which comes first from your house, he should go give it to And the man went, and God gave him victory. And then he was coming home in victory. His only daughter, only child, was the first that came out 
to welcome daddy home. And think about how that man would have felt. He would just collapse. <laughs> but now he had to do to God what he said he would do for God. And you know that man truly offered his child. Call the child. Say, this is my promise to God. You know, a lot of us here would have changed our minds. Say, God, you know, <laughs> Lord, I was just playing now. God, ah, ah, God. <laughs> God, please forgive me. I, I won't do it again. Please, Lord. Only this time. That's what we would have done. But you know, God doesn't speak that kind of language. When he said, Test me, test me, and see. When a man truly tests God, God will come through for it. Yes, he will. That's him. That's God's nature. That's God's nature. You say, God, and a lot of us do that. God, if you just give me that job, I will win 20 souls in two months. God! That house, if you just give it to me, we'll be having fellowship in my house. God said, okay. <laughs> All right. I heard you. <laughs> and God will truly give you that joy. He'll make a way. Ah, heaven, there's joy in heaven for every sinner that repent. He'll make a way. And you'll get a job. And God is waiting. Where's my 10 souls, 20 souls? First month, second month, third month, th fifth month. No souls. Zero souls. And you know God doesn't forget those things. And he gives you the house. He said, God, you know the house. Is at. God, it's so beautiful. All the legs of all the church members, they are going to scratch my floor. Can't have fellowship. God, his language is different from my language. His thoughts are different from my thoughts. God, if you can just open the door that I will come to the United States. Ah, God, I will serve you. And then after he comes, he's eating burgers. I forget, he forget this. <laughs> I say, brother, I come to church. Sister, we don't see each other. He says, oh, pastor, you know, it's America, man. It's America, man. Do we have to go to church every day? Yeah. <laughs> At least I was there two weeks ago. That's good enough. God doesn't speak that kind of language. When I test God and I try him, God will come through. But he expects me to come through as well. So when I go to God on the mountaintop, God is molding me. When you find yourself, ladies and gentlemen, in the porter's house, and God begins to prune you, it shows that you are in God's presence. That God called you to a mountain. You know, you can be doing all kinds of things. You're living your life, doing your thing, and God interrupts it. You know why? Because of love. God loves you so much that he will interrupt your life and say, I got to prune this out of you. I need to remove this. I need to take this out. Because I cannot use you the way you are. I got to make you as a vessel that is meant. You know what that means? That is meant for my use. That is tailor-made for me. I need to make you how I want you to be. So you can be useful to me. The clay doesn't tell the potter how or what it want to be the part of makes that decision i want to mold you into a plate then he gets molded into a plate i want to mold you into a cup he gets molded into a cup so none of this item go to the part and say well i want to be a plate no god brings you to the mountaintop he wants to prune you and prepare you for an assignment for him. That's what happened to Moses. God brings Moses up there. 40 days, 40 nights. Moses is fasting before God. God is pruning him. 
And you know that when you prune a tree, you're a tree man, you understand better. When you prune a tree, you're allowing it to grow the more. So when God brings you to the mountaintop and he's pruning you, he's allowing you space to grow. Like an eagle, after 40 days and 40 nights, you mount up wings like eagles. And then you run, you're not weary. You walk, you don't faint. Supernatural power coming to you. That's what happens when God calls you to the mountaintop. So it's always a blessing, ladies and gentlemen, when you're called by God. But in the tabernacle of the congregation, God is making them. It's making them. It's making them to be like Moses. He took the spirit out of Moses and put it in them. So because the same spirit is in all of them, they all act alike. There are 70 little Moseses. And that's what God wants to do. God seem to be a homogenic God. We want to be like Jesus. Don't want you to be like Peter and want you to be like Apollos. No, that's division. We want to grow to the image of Christ. We have Christ and Christ alone. Every single person needs to be like Jesus. That's it. You can't be like none of us but Jesus. So God is saying to all of them, you cannot be your own man. You have to be like Moses. And therefore, I take the spirit in Moses, I put it in you all. So you all have the spirit of Moses. All of us need to have the spirit of Christ. Can't be part of him if you don't have his spirit. Can't be part of him, can't be like him if you don't have his spirit. Now, let's just go back to the book of Acts. The apostle, and I think I've said this before, that when they called them Christians, it was them who called them Christians. It was not them who went around and announced themselves, you know, we are Christians. We are Christians. No, no, no. no. It was in Antioch. And they saw these individuals. They were different. And they began to watch them. Hmm. 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 Okay. Hmm. And they said, well, we remember somebody who was called Jesus. And he preached. And he laid hand on folk. And he delivered them. Hmm. These folk look like just that Jesus that we knew. And they said, wow. These are Christ-like. That is the definition of Christianity. That we are Christ-like. It's homogene, hom homogeneity. One single, one single Christ can be, you can be, you can be yourself and come into the presence of God and go back the same without the spirit of God in you. If I choose to be me and continue to be me, I cannot be like him because I want to be like me. So when I go to the mountaintop, I let myself lose to God. And I say, God, mold me. And that's where I build faith. I build my faith with God. Because I have been in the presence of God. What you have seen with your own eyes. And comprehended with your own mind. Nobody can tell you that it is fake. Nobody can tell Moses that there was no God. Because, you see, the rest of them, the rest of them down, down in the valley, they, they can say whatever they want. But Moses was there. Moses even said, God, can you just show me yourself? I, wanna, I really want to see you. God said to Moses, ha, ha, ha. except you're ready to die. <laughs> I said, you're ready to die. He said, but I still need you. But I just show you part of me and he went by him such a man you can never tell him that there was no God the reason that some of us our faith still shake whether God is alive whether it's with you whether God does miracle whether God does this, you know why because you have not seen him in his glory wait until you see him 
wait until you see him. It was many years ago I was sick. I thought I was going to die. I was little then. That's the beginning of my faith in God. And I, and I used medication. It wouldn't work. I thought I was going to die. And I remember that night. can never forget. I laid down on my bed. The lights were off. It was that peach room. I laid down. And somehow. Late in the night. A bright light came through the wall. And I could see somebody, a figure, standing by me. All white, top to bottom. Couldn't see his face because what he wore pointed out that I couldn't see his face. And he touched me that day. And I felt energy come through my body. And immediately I was healed that night. And I knew that it's my healer, Jesus. And after that experience, ladies and gentlemen, nobody in this world can tell me that Jesus is not alive. Nobody. See, like I said many times, I do this work not because I read so much of the Bible. Yes, I went to Bible college, studied the Bible. But it's the experience that I have with him that compel me to stand here. It's what my eyes have seen. It's what my ears have heard. It's what my heart has perceived that compels me to stand and speak the way I speak. Because you can never give what you don't have. You can never teach what you have not experienced. Can never. Never teach it. When I pray for women who are waiting for children, I pray with passion. I don't believe anybody who has never gone through that will pray like that. Because I know how. I had to wait six years to be able to have a child. Even though I was a pastor of a church. I know how it feels. Nobody else who never went through that can pray like that for somebody who is going through that. It's not. I knew how I was poor when I had nothing. I had to eat from hand to mouth. I had nothing. No clothing, no shoes, nothing. Couldn't afford none of those. When I pray for somebody who is poor, I'm praying from where I came from. Because I've been there. So it's different. Somebody who has never experienced what you're going through may tell you, well, brother, I understand. No, you don't. Because you have never been there. You've never walked in my shoes. And if you have never walked in my shoes, you don't understand how my legs hurt. And you can never empathize with me if you've never been there. You can never. You know, folk can tell you theory. We can tell you stories of the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible and tell you the story. But it takes somebody who has experienced God, like we're talking about Moses, to come out and tell you, Jehovah said. And he means it because he's been there with Jehovah. Praise the Lord. Lift up your hand and just bless the Lord. Lift up your hand and just bless the Lord. Tell, Lord, tell the Lord. If you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request, we would like to hear about it. Please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www.kingstabernacle.org. You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are bringing the kingdom to the nation.